What if the best plane doesn't always win? The Lockheed L-1011 TriStar was built to outshine the DC-10. It had a quieter cabin, smarter systems, and the RV-211 triple spool engine that set new standards. Politics, money, and timing flipped everything upside down. This is the rise and fall timeline. And hey, if you love aviation stories like this, hit that subscribe button and join us here on JetLogic. More case studies from the world of aviation are coming your way. The late 1960s were electric for aviation. The world had just spent two decades soaring higher and faster. Jet travel was no longer some fancy idea, it was how the world moved. Airports buzzed like beehives, airlines were hungry for bigger planes, and passengers wanted comfort, not just speed. The old workhorses, the Boeing 707s and DC-8s had served well, they were starting to show their age. The world wanted something bolder. Between 1966 and 1968, the big race began. Airlines tossed out their wish lists like candy. They wanted jets that could carry hundreds of people across oceans, fly farther without stops, and make every seat feel less cramped. Wide-body aircraft were the dream. Jets with wide cabins that felt more like flying lounges than metal tubes. Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas smelled opportunity. Boeing had its eyes on the giant 747. But these two saw a sweet spot. Something smaller, cheaper, and easier to fill. Tri-jets became the golden ticket. Why three engines? Four were expensive and noisy. Two weren't trusted for long ocean hops yet. Three was the perfect compromise. American Airlines, United, TWA, and a few major international carriers were ready to write checks. Whoever won their hearts would own the skies of the 1970s. The market heated and stakes sky high. Lockheed and McDonnell Douglas both raced to lock in launch orders, and engines would decide the winner. Two planes, one mission, and two very different ways to get there. Lockheed came out swinging with the L-1011 TriStar, a sleek machine packed with futuristic features promising big performance. Under its skin sat three mighty RB-211 turbofan engines. One tucked under each wing, and the third cleverly buried in the tail with a unique S-duct that made the plane quieter and smoother. The cabin, a roomy 18 feet wide. Not bad for the era. Depending on the model, the 1, 200, or 500, the TriStar could cruise at around 520 knots, fly up to nearly 6,000 miles, and carry hundreds of passengers in comfort. However, the L-011-1 was limited to a range of 4,000 miles. Its takeoff weight stretched over 500,000 pounds in later versions. This was serious muscle. McDonnell Douglas took a different route. Their DC-10 was also a tri-jet. They went with a straight-through tail engine. Simpler, easier to maintain and they powered it based on already trusted technology, GE CF-6 and Pratt & Whitney's JT-9D. The fuselage was just a little wider, roughly 19 feet 9 inches, giving airlines flexible seating layouts. The 30 and 40 variants had the range and payload to go head-to-head -head with the TriStar. Where Lockheed leaned into tech, Donald Douglas leaned into practicality. The TriStar had better pressurization, smoother rides, and more advanced avionics. It was like flying a luxury car. The DC-10 was like a tough pickup, reliable, familiar, and cheaper to fix. And for airlines nervous about risky technology, that mattered. On paper, the TriStar often checked more boxes, but the big question was, who could deliver and with what engines? The RB-211 was supposed to be the crown jewel. Rolls-Royce promised an engine that would sip fuel like never before hush the cabin noise and make the L-1011 the smoothest wide body in the sky. The secret weapon? A triple spool design. Three rotating shafts spinning inside each other like a mechanical symphony. It's bold, elegant, and a little risky. But in aviation, timing is everything. Almost immediately, the problems piled up. The original fan blades, made of a fancy new composite material, cracked during testing. The weight ballooned. Cost followed. Deadline slipped. And for Lockheed, each week of delay was like burning cash in a furnace. Airlines grew impatient. They wanted planes in the air, not promises on paper. By early 1971, Rolls-Royce was drowning. The RB-211 program had gone so far over budget that the company collapsed into bankruptcy. This wasn't just bad news, it's a full-blown crisis. 
UK government had to step in and nationalize Rolls-Royce just to keep the engine alive. But that rescue didn't happen overnight. Meanwhile, Lockheed's delivery schedule shattered. The only one engine option, it had nowhere to run. Canceled orders, penalty payments, rising program costs, the dominoes fell fast. Engineers at Rolls-Royce worked day and night to redesign the fan blades. Politicians debated bailouts. Airline CEOs took furious phone calls. It was chaos in slow motion. The RB211 would become a technological success, but its timing made the L1011 pay the price. In the jet age, winning isn't just about building a great airplane. It's about winning the order book. In the early 1970s, McDonnell Douglas played that game like a pro. While Lockheed wrestled with engine delays, McDonnell Douglas was shaking hands and signing contracts. American Airlines became the launch customer for the DC-10. It was later joined by United Airlines. Why? Because McDonnell Douglas could promise what Lockheed couldn't. Airplanes on time. They used engines already available, cutting uncertainty out of the deal. Airlines love certainty. The numbers tell the story. In the 1970s, DC-10 deliveries outpaced the TriStar by a wide margin. Lockheed's order book never built the same momentum. Every delay pushed a customer toward its rival. Price played its part, too. Donald Douglas offered flexible terms, lower upfront costs, faster delivery schedules, and fewer risks. Lockheed had performance guarantees tied to an engine still in limbo. For airlines under pressure to fill seats and grow routes, the safer bet was obvious. Politics played a big role, too. In 1971, Lockheed leaned on $250 million in U.S. loan guarantees, which instantly rattled airlines. Bailout talk made the company look shaky, no matter the details. Meanwhile, McDonnell Douglas swooped in with a cleaner image, sharper sales pitch, and no political baggage. This wasn't about who had the fancier airplane. It was about who showed up first with a working one. In that race, timing beat technology. As orders flowed to the DC-10, Lockheed's pipeline thinned, and their financial runway shortened. Building a complex widebody is a money-hungry logistical beast. Lockheed decided to jump into the widebody race. It wasn't just building a plane, it was building an empire of parts, suppliers, and high-stakes bets. Unlike McDonnell Douglas, which leaned on an already seasoned network, Lockheed went bold. New tooling, new subcontractors, new ways of doing things. It sounded visionary, but it came with a monster price tag. Here's the thing about big jets. Fixed costs are brutal. You pay for tooling, test rigs, prototype builds, and flight testing up front. These aren't costs that don't care whether you sell 10 planes or 100. Lockheed poured hundreds of millions into specialized tooling and advanced production setups, especially to accommodate the RB211 engine, which itself was behind schedule. Every delay meant rework. Every rework meant dollars slipping away. Meanwhile, McDonnell Douglas played it safe. They leaned on existing suppliers and a conservative design that kept unit costs lower. Because DC-10 orders were piling up faster, they spread those massive fixed costs across more airplanes. That's economies of scale in action. Each plane got cheaper as the line moved. Lockheed didn't have that cushion. Cash flow tightened, overruns grew, and the RB211 delays only worsened the bleeding. Unlike McDonnell Douglas, which had a broader commercial portfolio, Lockheed's civil arm was exposed. They had no other major program to soak up the shock. The numbers told a harsh story. As DC-10 unit costs stabilized, TriStars crept upward. For every jet that rolled off the line, Lockheed was spending more and earning less. The books told a brutal truth. Lockheed needed sustained orders and timely engines. Neither arrived. Test flights reveal design strengths and occasionally fatal weaknesses. The TriStar's first flight took off on November 16, 1970. Certification came in April 1972, with service entry in April 1972 with Eastern Airlines. The DC-10, meanwhile, first flew on August 29, 1970 entered service with American Airlines in August 1971, just a year earlier. But in commercial aviation, that year made all the difference. Both aircraft went through grueling flight test programs. The L-1011 racked up over 1,500 hours, proving its advanced flight deck and smooth ride. But its schedule was dictated by the RB-211's delays. McDonnell Douglas got to the market faster, and in aviation, 
speed to market often beats perfection. The DC-10 had a stormier start, early cargo door failures, design issues, and safety scares. The L-1011's airframe, on the other hand, was rock solid. No big structural faults, no early disasters. But commercial airlines can't fly a perfect airframe without engines. Training also told a story. The L-1011 had a more advanced flight deck with auto land and triple redundancy. Great for safety, but it required more training for pilots and maintenance crews. The DC-10's simpler systems meant faster integration into airline fleets. Passengers loved the TriStar. Quiet, roomy, smooth. But by the time it was ready, airlines had already filled their schedules with DC-10s. On the ramp, the TriStar impressed, but its delayed debut left McDonnell Douglas's DC-10 to a massive advantage. Hey, before we dive into its safety record and some of the incidents that shaped its reputation, make sure you hit that subscribe button. There's a lot more coming your way, and trust me, the next part flips the story on its head. Public perception is shaped by headlines, not technical nuance. When it comes to airplanes, people don't always remember engineering, they remember the crashes. And in the 1970s, few jets carried heavier baggage in the headlines than the DC-10. While both the DC-10 and L-1011 shared the skies, their reputations took very different paths. The DC-10 suffered a string of early high-profile accidents that carved deep scars into the public's mind. The most infamous was American Airlines Flight 191 in 1979, a catastrophic engine detachment and crash in Chicago that killed all 271 on board. It remains the deadliest aviation accident in U.S. history. That one accident changed everything. Insurance costs shot up, passenger confidence wobbled, some airlines even faced booking drops just from flying DC-10s. Meanwhile, Lockheed's TriStar quietly built a very different kind of record. Fewer hull losses, fewer fatalities. A strong safety reputation among crews and passengers alike. But here's the thing. Perception doesn't wait for technical reports. A few fiery front page headlines can outweigh thousands of flawless flights. Even after the DC-10's flaws were fixed through airworthiness directives and design improvements, its name carried a shadow. Regulators tightened rules, airlines updated training, Public trust? That took far longer to rebuild. In the public eye, reputations hardened, and reputation often equals profitability in the airline biz. This was as much politics as engineering. The fall of the TriStar wasn't written in a hangar, it was written in boardrooms, government offices, and oil markets. When Rolls-Royce went bankrupt, the British government stepped in to save the RB211 engine. But across the Atlantic, Lockheed faced a far colder political climate. The U.S. government hesitated to prop up a commercial airliner program, even though Lockheed was a major defense contractor. Then came the brutal economics of the 1970s. Oil shocks, inflation, airlines tightening their wallets, order books slowed, and Lockheed's balance sheet groaned under the massive weight of L-1011 development costs. They tried to cut costs, trim variants, and secure export credit deals, but the numbers didn't add up. Donald Douglas of more orders and earlier deliveries could ride the storm. Lockheed couldn't. Politics, oil shock, and a fragile balance sheet combined to turn engineering promise into corporate pain. Despite commercial failure, the TriStar left meaningful technical fingerprints. By the time the dust settled, the scoreboard told the story in black and white. Lockheed built just 250 L-1011 TriStars. Donald Douglas, over 440 DC-10s rolled out of the factory. On the ramp, the DC-10 outlasted its rival, not because it was prettier or more beloved, but because airlines voted with their wallets. While the TriStar's production line shut down in 1984, DC-10s kept working well into the 2000s. Many reborn as freighters and KC-10 tankers for the U.S. Air Force. But here's the thing, TriStar's technology didn't die. The RB-211 engine family evolved powering future jets like the Boeing 747-400 and Airbus A330. This triple spool design set a new standard in efficiency and noise control. The L-1011's S-duct engine layout became an engineering icon, and its environmental control systems and smooth pressurization earned it a reputation for being a passenger favorite. Airlines like TWA, Delta, and British Airways flew TriStars for years. Even when the balance sheet said failure, the jet's reputation set ahead of its time. 
Enthusiasts still see it as the underdog that should have won. The TriStar spirit lived on in engines, tech, and a devoted fan base, but the commercial ledger never balanced. Time for a side-by-side -side scorecard. Who truly outperformed whom? Let's strip away the nostalgia and look at the cold, hard numbers. First flight, DC-10 in 1970. TriStar in 1970 as well, but the DC-10 entered service first in 1971. The TriStar followed in 1972. Both cruised around 520 to 525 knots, but while the DC-10 stretched its range up to roughly 6,600 miles in the 30 variant, the early TriStar 1 managed around 4,000 miles, with later variants closing the gap. The DC-10 had a slightly wider cabin, more payload flexibility, and crucially, more customers. In production, the numbers speak loudly. 446 DC-10s versus 250 TriStars. With more frames flying, McDonnell Douglas achieved better economies of scale. Maintenance costs stayed leaner and parts flowed easier. Airlines cared about numbers, not poetry. Technically, though, the L-1011 was a marvel. Its cockpit automation, wider cabin, and better environmental controls made it beloved by crews. It also earned a strong safety record, unlike the DC-10's rocky early years. But innovation came with a price tag Lockheed couldn't carry. So who really won? Engineering crown L-1011. Business crown, DC-10. Aviation doesn't hand out trophies for effort. If aviation was a courtroom, the DC-10 won on timeliness and bankability. The TriStar was acquitted on engineering but convicted by cash flow. Imagine the TriStar launched on time. Would history change? Let's play a little game of what if. Picture this. The RB211 engine arrives on schedule. Lockheed delivered the TriStar on time in 1971. Airlines hungry for a modern wide body sign on faster. The order book fills up. With enough volume, Lockheed spreads costs and pushes out new variants. Maybe a longer range 600. Maybe a freighter version. Maybe the TriStar becomes the standard mid-size widebody of the 1970s. Then think bigger. If Lockheed had deeper financial backing or a consortium like Airbus, the TriStar could have stayed in the fight. It might have slowed the rise of the Airbus A300 or delayed Boeing's 767 dominance. A TriStar tanker? Very possible. A freighter fleet for global cargo giants? Also plausible. Of course, this is speculation. But each scenario flows from real pressure points. Engines, timing, and cash flow. The L-1011 had the tech, just didn't have the clock on its side. Alternate histories are intoxicating, but reality is what airlines actually bought and paid for. The L-1011 was engineering bravado. Elegant, quiet, and ahead in tech. Yet aviation is brutal to late arrivals. The RB211's timing, macroeconomic shocks, and sales momentum swung the market. Lockheed's TriStar remains a lesson. Sometimes the best plane doesn't win, one that lands on time does. If you're into aviation stories like this, give it a like, drop your thoughts in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe to JetLogic. We've got plenty more coming your way, and you won't want to miss the next one.